Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all. But before we begin our program, officially, we will start with our land acknowledgement. Mount Holyoke College begins each event in the life of the college by acknowledging that those of us in Western Massachusetts are occupying the ancestral land of the Nanatuck people. We also acknowledge the neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. We encourage every member of our community to learn about the original inhabitants of the land where they reside. The impact of settler colonization contributed to the displacement, removal, and attempted genocide of indigenous peoples. This land acknowledgement seeks to verbalize Mount Holyoke's commitment to engage in shared responsibility as part of our collective humanity. We urge everyone to participate in action steps identified by indigenous community-based organizations. Thank you for listening and taking that in. And now, I'm so pleased to welcome Addison Bow, class of 99, back to campus. Addison is remembered by many, especially me, <laughs> as a student activist on campus. While chair of the SGA Senate, Addison served on the lead organizing team of what was called the 1997 Campus Uprising for Equity which Mother Jones Magazine recognized as one of the most successful student protests of the year. One direct result of the protest was the creation of two new cultural centers, the Jeanette Marks House and the Asian Center for Empowerment, known as the ACE House. Following the protests, Addison was elected SGA president. That was the same year that I began my role as Dean of the College. <laughs> so Addison and I had lots of opportunity to get to know each other during that year. Addison continues to serve as class of 1999 Vice President and remains actively engaged with the Alum Association. Professionally, Addison serves as an Executive Leadership Strategic Communication and Management Consulting Asset. His company is called Bow and Arrow. Before becoming a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, he served as a staffer to Congressman, excuse me, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, speechwriter to the President and Board of Trustees at Stanford University, Congressional Liaison and speechwriter at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and lead researcher at the Center for Economic Integrity. Along the way, Addison and I reconnected at Stanford University. I was a visiting scholar there in residence during the spring of 2017. And unbeknownst to me, Addison was working for the president of Stanford as a speechwriter. When Addison learned I was at Stanford, he sent me an email and invited me to meet up with him for coffee, and we did. And I had not seen or talked to Addison since graduation back in 1999. So here we are 18 years later at Stanford. And certainly a lot had changed in Addison's life since then. We had a great conversation. But now here we are. And again, a lot has changed in Addison's life. Instead of writing speeches at Stanford, now Addison is a business owner and tech entrepreneur. So I'm very eager to hear about mm -hmm. this new chapter as well as chat about some of the earlier chapters. And I know that many of you are here today to learn from Addison as well. So let's get started. <laughs> um, in these conversations, I often ask my guests to start at the beginning of the story, which usually we start with Mount Holyoke. But in this case, I want to start at the end, mm -hmm. which is where we are right now. Mm -hmm. So Addison, tell us what you're doing and what brought you to this path in your career journey. Mm -hmm. Well, first, just thank you so much for this opportunity. It is really an honor to have a conversation with you. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Sanders McMurtry for the opportunity to be here, because this is, this is really a, a, a profound and moving honor, actually. I found myself getting a little emotional uh, when you started to, to speak, and particularly during the land acknowledgment. So I, I want to just center myself, because it was surprisingly emotional, because um, 
the, the Mount Holyoke is a place that I love so very much. And so to acknowledge the land is also to acknowledge the, the violence that you know, is colonization. So just the introduction of holding at the same time, which is something I think I did at Mount Holyoke too, is holding so much love for, for a place and then also having to wrestle and reconcile and repair um, the, the history the, uh, of violence on the land is just very powerful. So I, I, I'm saying that because I just, um, I found myself feeling emotional and was even moved mm -hmm. to tears hearing the acknowledgement because just feeling that all at once, just so much love and also um, the truth of the, the history. So thank you, for, I really appreciate that we began that way mm -hmm. and that Mount Holyoke begins that way because it's so important. So I wasn't expecting to feel that way, so I just wanted to say that, yeah, and then I will gladly answer your question around how I, um, how and why I'm here, and how bow and arrow happened. Yes, let's start with bow and yes. arrow. Yes. So, so bow and arrow is um, a company that I, I started, and it is all things leadership and communication. So I'm a consultant, a coach, and a strategic advisor on all things leadership and communication. And I do that with, um, with individuals, with teams, and with organizations at large. And they can be nonprofit organizations to for-profit organizations. And sometimes I am uh, an executive coach, so I advise the, and coach C-suite members. So CEOs or C and CTOs, chief technology officers, CFOs, chief financial officers. That's what the, you know, the C-suite um, or the, the senior most leaders, often in companies, but I also work with executive directors of nonprofits mm -hmm. um, and board of directors, company board of directors, that kind of thing. And, it's, um, and so what I do is any leadership quandary of the many leadership quandaries that individuals and teams have, um, I work with them to, to get clearer on what it is, they, who they are, um, whether their identity as a human being, or identity as a team, identity as an organization, and how they can better align their intention and who they are and aspire to be with their language and their actions, both individually and institutionally, so that they can be better, more equitable, and in some cases more profitable and or more successful in terms of whatever those metrics are. So, so that's what I do, and how that happened, on one form or another, I've been offering that kind of advice, usually on an unsolicited basis, <laughs> for my, the entirety of my life, my parents would tell you I was offering them, I was offering them some leadership advice uh, as a kid, unsolicited, and certainly at Mount Holyoke, I offered certainly. lots of unsolicited uh, <laughs> advice and counsel, and so now I, I get paid to give solicited <laughs> advice, which is awesome, okay, I love it. But how, how that started is prior, just prior to that, I was the speechwriter to the president of Stanford University, Mark Tessier-Levine, who's a really wonderful man. Um, he's a neuroscientist, he spent his, his uh, life trying to cure dementias, and is just a wonderful person, and I really loved it. And. By how I got that job, by the way, is um, Stanford Business School started the, the first that's known in the world, the first LGBTQ plus focused executive education program. And so I applied for that and was in the inaugural class of that at Stanford's uh, business school. And in that cohort was someone who worked at Stanford. I worked at the time in Washington, D.C. for uh, the federal government, um, uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is, is the, um, it's a, it was the, stood up by Elizabeth Warren, mm -hmm. and it was the, it's the banking regulator for, for all of, for, for everyday people, for our credit cards, mortgages, stuff like that, and it was the, it's the first agency of its kind, so it was a great, it was really tremendous to work there. But while I was there, I applied for this program at the, at the Stanford uh, Business School, and so while I was in this LGBTQ plus executive education program, a staffer uh, at, at Stanford, a senior leader at Stanford, was also in the program and said, you know, we have a new president coming and I think they're looking for a speechwriter. Would you consider doing it? And I said, I, I, I've always wanted to live in California. I love Massachusetts, but I always felt like I was, I was born on the wrong coast. <laughs> so I, uh, I applied and then, and then got that job and it was absolutely a dream job. But at the same time, so I was living on the East Coast and I get this dream job on the West Coast. 
And since I, from five to 40 years old, I had been contemplating my gender. I mean, I knew, I, was, I wasn't contemplating my gender, I was contemplating what to do about my gender. Because when I was five, it was very clear to me, I knew with all certainty, that while my sex assigned at birth was female, that was not at all aligned with who I knew myself to be. I knew myself to be, to be male. And, but I'm sort of a slow mover sometimes, so it, like, it's very typical for me to think about something for 35 years and be like, <laughs> okay, I think, I'm, I think I'll do it now. Um, so it was about that time that I thought, okay, wait, this is perfect timing because I'll be moving from one coast to another and one job to another. So, and, and I also had, I also had the money to sort of do some of the things involved in transitioning. So um, I decided to, to, to transition, um, to affirm my gender. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because I actually applied for the job to be the speechwriter under the, the beautiful name that my parents gave me, which, is, which was a beautiful name that I, that I really love and feel great affection for. And, and then when I accepted the job, they gave me the details and said, is there anything else you, know, you need from us or we need to know? And I said, you know, there's one more thing. And uh, I'm transgender and I will, be, I will have a new name and different pronouns. And if you could sort of put everything in those names and pronouns, that would be great. And to their credit, it was just seamless. It was, I think they accidentally broke the law. Uh, they were so friendly about it because my health insurance was supposed to be, it's like your legal name and my legal name hadn't changed yet, but they were just so supportive that they put everything under my, the name that I gave them, and, and, um, which was amazing. But the health insurance company was like, wait, we have a few things to talk about we didn't understand. But anyway, it was incredibly smooth. I, that is the way to go if you're gonna make mistakes. It was, I was so happy they made one that really made my life easier. But so while I was working um, for the president, this was also my first year of really being myself. And I mean, I was always myself before, as much myself as I could be. But this was really the first, this was, a, I felt a peace that I, that I really didn't, I, I had never known before. And I didn't know that I didn't know it until I felt it. Mm -hmm. So I had not realized just how much um, pain, actually, I had been in until it wasn't there anymore. And I felt so free and happy and relieved and comfortable in my own skin that um, once I realized that life could feel that way, I, didn't, I, I suddenly had a very low tolerance for anything that didn't feel that way. Because I had, I had this high pain tolerance, basically, I didn't know that I had. Mm -hmm. I was so used to feeling uncomfortable in such a deep systemic way that I just thought discomfort was normal. So mm -hmm. I would be, a, I was a workaholic and would push my body to just all boundaries through work, working all the time. And in other ways, I just, I just got so used to discomfort. So a communications job, you know, a speech writing job is a comms job. And comms jobs are 24 seven jobs, especially when you're, when you are a, working for you know an incredible person who is the president of a college and it's a great it's a tremendous honor but uh, it, this was also I w it was my first year of working for the president it was also my first year of being Addison Bow and it was my first time and my first year of feeling deep peace and relief and comfort and I had I had a very unexpected experience which was I didn't want to work so much anymore I wanted to enjoy life I, I it was no longer okay with me to give my life over to my job, which, was, which had been okay with me before. So this was a very big surprise because I really identified as being somebody who loved working all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was very helpful to work all the time because then I didn't have to feel or think about my discomfort. Mm -hmm. And it was a helpful way because I earned a living that way and I gained lots of experience. So it wasn't a bad way to spend my time, it wasn't a bad way to endure discomfort but I no longer wanted to do that. So I loved working for President Tessier Levine, but what I loved even more was this feeling I had of feeling peaceful and liberated for the first time in my life. So I decided that I wanted more of that and that the only way I would probably be able to experience that would be for some period of time to work for myself. I also, I come from pretty working class roots, so financially my, my family and my ancestors worked really, really hard for everything that they had and sometimes didn't have. So I never wanted to have financial instability in my own life just because I, it was hard, it was really hard. Mm -hmm. And 
So I never thought I would have the confidence to leave a job without another job. And I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area and I really had not saved enough money. It's, it's like the amount of money that I left my job with was like, it was, it was, it was not wise. I, if, I, if I was advising myself, I would say, don't do it, wait a little longer, you know, but I, I didn't do that. But so I decided to leave my job and to start, and to start my own company because I, I had done a really good job at Stanford and I had a great experience working for the board and I realized, you know, if you can do this for all these folks, you can probably do this on your own. So being, so you know, affirming my gender really gave me a confidence uh, to, to trust myself. I was like, you know, I can do anything. I just did this, and this was really hard. I can do anything. So I left a really amazing job with a really amazing salary, honestly, that I just never thought that I would be able to leave, but to do something a lot more important to me, which is to just have a lot more sovereignty and autonomy over my time. That's what I really wanted. So I took this big risk and started uh, my own company. And everybody says when you start your own company, it's going to take five years before you start making money. And I hated that they said that because I was like, I don't have five years. You know, I need to like pay my rent now and all this stuff. But they were actually totally correct. <laughs> Just so you know. I'm now at around that time and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Um, I finally hit that Malcolm Gladwell tipping point where I'm like, this is wonderful. I'm, paying my bills and I have money to save. This is awesome. So anyways, this is the long story of yeah. how it happened. But as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking back to the fact that we had that coffee in the yes. spring of 2017. That's right. And so it must have been just after or maybe even in the middle of, I mean, you, you introduced yourself right. as Addison Bow, right? That's right. right. Um, but I didn't realize it was such a new thing when we were talking to each other. Yes. Right. But listening to your story now, I'm thinking it must have been just... A couple of months. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it was um, in December of 2016 was the last day of my job in D.C. And I had this two-week window before I would start my new job. So part of my journey was to have uh, gender affirming surgery, in this case, top surgery. So I s slipped it and I was like, this is the workaholic. I was like, I have two weeks. I can get this all done. I can move out of my DC home. I can have gender affirming surgery and then I can fly and start my new job. So this is how I planned it. Uh, it turned out that my dad actually had a minor stroke during this time, so I, packed up all my stuff and put it in storage to save time and figured I'll come back and get it. Mm -hmm. FYI, I came back three years later to get my stuff out of storage. So I lived in California for years without my stuff and that's when I had the time. But so, so I, I could go spend time with my dad. So I spent time with my dad and then flew to uh, Florida where I had surgery and it was actually, this is, again, I do not advise this. Mm -hmm. It was five days post-op so I had surgery and got on a flight from Fort Lauderdale five days later mm. to San Francisco because my job started on January 3rd and um, the flight was late. So I got in around four in the morning and then started my job at eight in the morning four hours later. Wow. Four hours later. Yes, again, I do, you, if you had told me, you probably shouldn't, I would, I'll be, you know, I would not have listened because I don't listen to advice really. I have to experience my failures until I learn from them. No one can tell, tell me otherwise. But I do, so I don't advise it. I think you should really give yourself 10 days at least. Maybe probably some people would say 14 would probably be better. But that's, yeah, but that's how yeah. that happened. But it was brand new. So that happened in December. And in fact, at Stanford was the first time I used my name, Addison Bow. And then I announced it to my family and friends in the first week of January. And then, yeah, so it was three, it was just within three months. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's thank you for sharing yeah. that. I, I know that um, you often talk about the evolution of your identity. Yes. And I'm wondering if you could talk about how your Mount Holyoke experience fits into that. I, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be having this conversation, I mean, obviously we wouldn't be having this conversation if I did not go to Mount Holyoke, because that would be weird if I was, if I was here in this conversation. Um, but um, who I am, I mean, my family, my family, my ancestors have really, like, other than my family and my ancestors who've just shaped me so much, Mount Holyoke is really the next biggest influence in my life. I, I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to, to come here because uh, 
this is where all aspects of my identity were, I, I was able to even understand what the possibilities were. So um, in terms of, I mean, there's my gender journey, there's also my journey in terms of my consciousness, my mm -hmm. social consciousness, and um, liberation as a queer person is foundational, and as a feminist, as an intersectional feminist. The, the greatest gift Mount Holyoke gave me, I mean, there's so many, the, the friendships and the connections and obviously the education, but if I had to say that the concept that I learned here that, has, that changed me as a person and changed my whole life is intersectional feminism and the interconnectedness of different forms of oppression and the importance of working in an intersectional way um, with, with all who, who are oppressed and all who suffer and the importance of doing that. That has been the most transformational thing, which mm -hmm. then queer theology and liberation and all this played into that and allowed me to understand who I, gave me the freedom to understand who I was as a person and also a framework for understanding the importance of being part of honoring everyone's dignity, all other people's dignity. So I would say that the technology of intersectional feminism made my gender journey possible and infuses also my journey with feminism, with intersectional feminism. So the kind of man I, I am, there's no other way for me to be, in my view, than being an intersectional feminist as a, as a man, that my journey as a transgender man is connected to and must support the liberation journeys of, of all, because they're, it's, it's all this, it's, the same violence in different degrees mm -hmm. and certainly in different ways. But so Mount Holyoke is the, is the place where I was introduced to Audre Lorde, Sherry Moraga, Gloria Anzaldúa, um, mm -hmm. where I read um, Transforming Silence into Language and Action, Audre, Audre Lorde's work. Th that happened here. Uh, when I think of uh, just the things that I read and I was exposed to, all of that happened here on, on these grounds. So I needed those things to, to be able to understand myself and to also just have the courage to be myself and to also know there were examples of other people who were being there themselves. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit more about yeah. that experience from the point of view of our intersection, yes. which was your life as a student activist. Yes. Right. So. Um, how do you think about that activism now? When you look, you know, your activism mm. then, your activism now. Yes. I feel very fortunate that I had the opportunity to do that activist work in service to the institution. So I look back at it and I feel very fortunate to have been able to have play a role. And I feel very proud of us. I feel there were more than 400 students who were part of that uprising which on a campus of this size is an extraordinary number. Mm -hmm. That's how um, intersectional it was. And there was a, a leadership team of six negotiators mm -hmm. uh, of the protests, of which I was one. And I feel very proud of that group of 400 people. And I feel very proud of the group of negotiators um, because it was really painful work. It was really hard. At least it was hard to us at that time. Generally speaking, there are people who've had to fight and work a lot harder. I mean, we're I mean, a, a very cushy, privileged institution doing activist work, and even though it was very challenging, with perspective, okay, you know, it was to some degree challenging. It was an amazing place to learn how to do it. So I feel um, grateful and very proud of us because we, we did really great work. We have the, the two cultural centers. Mm -hmm. And there were other things, like for example, that aren't often talked about, which was at the time, one of the policies that had been um, suggested was that the average SAT score must be 1300. At the time, it was under the old sort of SAT system. Mm -hmm. That had to be sort of the average score was 1300. And, and we had really pushed back against that for, for the, the bias and SAT testing and all of that. And um, what was amazing is the turnaround that happened is um, because the, 
the prior president, uh, or the president at the time, was the one sort of proposing it. And we had been so effective at our activism that I think it was maybe a year and a half or two years later, I actually heard her interviewed on NPR talking about why SATs should not even be required anymore. <laughs> and I thought, that is wonderful. I agree with her completely. <laughs> so it was. So there were all kinds of things that were really neat. Uh, my mom always says, God accomplishes great things through people who don't mind who gets the credit. And um, for many years, the, as activists, because we were suspended, it was, it was very difficult. Many of our family members didn't understand and were horrified that we were doing this work. Um, my parents learned about it because the Boston Globe was here and there was a photo of me hanging out the window of Mary Lyon because we had occupied a couple buildings. Um, and that's how they found it. I hadn't called them to say, hey, I probably give you a heads up. They saw it on the front page of the Boston Globe and then call, I was like, I'm so sorry, I've been really busy, I didn't have a chance <laughs> to let you know what was happening. Um, so, so the memories, I feel very proud of us as students, and I feel very grateful to the, to the organizers and to the students because I really learned so much through the example of uh, the leaders of, of that protest. And I, when I think about my own personal journey with it, um, what I'm great, so grateful to Mount Holyoke for is that I had this opportunity to learn how to be a leader in that context because I had a lot of learning to do. And when I think back on it, I cringe a little bit. I'm so proud, you know, I'm proud of myself because I had courage. I, I watched, I spent some time for my 20th reunion was a couple years ago in 2019. And so I spent time in the archives, which by the way, the archives are amazing. I love the archives. So shout out to the archives. I think when you come, if, when people come back for reunion, you've got to go to the archives. There's a file on you with cool stuff in it. And it was fun to look through the cool stuff in the archives. And so I looked up all the protest stuff and basically cried for two days because it was so profound. And um, the person who worked there, Micah, was just passing me tissues, was so kind because I was just sobbing in the, <laughs> in the archives reading about all the footage and I watched one video where I saw myself speak and I was, it was like looking at a different person because I was like, wow, you know, and I'm okay with calling myself, I'm okay with calling myself she when I watched that, um, that I get to do that because I am me and I get to call myself what I want and I get to refer to myself as I want to be referred to. But when I see her, this person was, she was so, um, confident and so bold and really said the thing. I was I can't believe I said that. You know, that's, that was like, I really said the thing, you know? And so I was so proud of that. And also there were things that honestly, I really, I'm, I'm graceful with myself, but there were things I also had to learn. And so when I think about what I, what I have learned when I look back at that, there were things I, I do wish I had done differently. And the word that always comes up the most is grace because I was really angry. I didn't understand how there were, you know, coming from the home that I grew up in, my parents were both investigative journalists and they were, they were really amazing people. And I just grew up in a home where you just did the right thing, whatever the right thing was. And mm -hmm. even with their kids, if we didn't do the right thing, they loved us, my parents loved us unconditionally, but they, they would say, you gotta do the right thing or we're gonna march you to wherever you need to go and tell them you need to do the right thing, you know? It was really, so coming into the world realizing that, that people didn't do the right thing a lot of the time, that they, there wasn't this orientation around what is justice and how do you take part in it. It was very painful to encounter a place that I loved so much and even people that I really respected so much who were behaving in ways that were really hard. And so I was angry about it. And I expressed that anger and in, in ways sometimes that were not as graceful as I would, like, I would have liked them to be. And I've since learned that. And I guess that's what college is for. It's to learn. And I, so I had learning to do plenty of it. And that was one of the things I learned. So when I look back on it, I feel very proud. And I also feel grateful to have learned a lot. And um, I wish I had been more graceful at times. And the last thing is I also wish I knew is I, had, I, have, I have such a passion for justice. And some of that passion comes from what's happening in the moment. But what I didn't know then that I know now is that also some of that passion came from justice that I wanted from other moments, earlier moments in my life that actually had nothing to do with the moment I was in. That there was some measure of intensity that I brought to those struggles that, was, that related to, he, to sort of healing work that I actually needed to do. 
But at the same time, the fact that I hadn't done that healing work was also why I was so passionate about justice because I knew what it, per what it felt like to, 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 ex to be dominated, to be treated unfairly, to be hurt, to be traumatized, mm -hmm. to experience violence. And so I didn't want that to happen to anyone else and I didn't want an institution that I loved to be part of it. But nonetheless, I learned that some of that healing didn't have to do with Mount Holyoke, actually. There were other things I needed to heal prior to Mount Holyoke that added to that intensity. So that was, that was very humbling for me to learn over the years with, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. But So I guess the short answer is I feel proud and still contemplative about it. Yeah, sure. I know that um, it hasn't really come up in our conversation, but I know that you, along the way, earned a degree in counseling. I right? did. Talk a little bit about that. Yes. So I was deciding, um, so after Mount Holyoke, I did a public policy fellowship, the Coro Fellowship. I lived in New York City, then I moved to Tucson, Arizona, and I actually studied body work for a little while. Like I, I studied massage therapy and Zen Shiatsu, which is acupressure massage, because I love the healing arts. But then after that, I was thinking, okay, I, I need to go back, I, I want to go to grad school. And I was deciding between, I'd, I've always been very passionate and very interested in healing, just human healing. How do we heal? How do we heal as individuals? How do institutions heal? How do we behave in ways that are pro-healing in, in the world? And, but I've also, also been very passionate about the law and justice. So I was deciding, do I, am I gonna be a therapist or am I gonna be a lawyer? And the way I decided it was I thought about the people that I love and mean the most to me, and I said, do the people I love and mean the most to me, do they need a, a therapist or a lawyer? Because I wanted to be useful. <laughs> you know, I wanted, if whatever I was gonna do, I wanted to be useful. So I was like, what are the people I love and need, need the most? And I was like, I, I'm gonna become a therapist. <laughs> so I decided to become a therapist. Also, a law school, I was a little concerned. I have a learning disability. I was also concerned about law school and whether I could do it, to be honest. I'm now preparing to take the LSAT because I'm still considering going to law school. I, I feel like I would love to be in school forever. Um, but I decided to become a therapist, and so I, I got my master's degree in counseling, and I particularly focused on um, child and family uh, therapy, and I particularly worked with um, kids from three to just shy of 18, like just before a kid turns 18 kids that had experienced childhood sexual abuse. Mm. And it was just some of the most meaningful work. It's like the, working with these kids is the closest I felt to just a power greater than myself. You know, it was really amazing. So I did, and I learned so much. Um, I studied for actually four years. Uh, it was in grad school that I discovered that I have a learning disability, that I'd had it my whole life. I was actually born with it, I, a genetic, I have a genetic condition that affects my ability to, to learn in particular ways. So it took me twice as long, four years instead of two, which I, I'm proud of myself. I'm very persistent. Um, I'm not proud of having to pay for two extra years of <laughs> grad school, um, which I'll be paying for probably forever. But I'm proud that I finished it. And it was, um, it was a wonderful experience, and I loved it. And I really learned so much. And what I'm grateful for, even though I'm not a practicing therapist now, is I am a trauma-informed mm -hmm person, trauma-informed, trauma I'm a trauma-informed coach, I'm a trauma-informed consultant, I'm a trauma-informed friend, um, I'm a trauma-informed stranger you're sitting next to on the, uh, at the bus stop. And that education was really, really valuable because if I could wave a magic wand and set the agenda for the world, and there was one, if I could pick the one thing that I think would make the biggest difference in the world, it would be to focus on on heal, trauma healing, preventing trauma mm -hmm. and healing from trauma. Mm -hmm. Because I really think it's where so much violence comes from, is the replication of trauma and cycles of trauma. Yeah. I know that our audience yes. will want to ask Is the time question. up already? No, no, it's not okay. up. I'm a real yammerer. But, but I have a question that I ask yes. everyone. Okay. So I, I am obligated to ask you. Okay. And however, you know, you used a word that I like to talk about, which is bold, mm. right? So, um, and I certainly remember you as bold, <laughs> let me just say. Um, but there is a phrase that I learned from one of our alums, a, mm. um, a person whose name is Sheila Marcello. Mm. Um, she described in an interview what it means to be authentically bold. Mm. And she said, when you bring your truest self to the table, 
you are able to be bold in your own authenticity. Mm. Which I thought is such a wonderful way to describe boldness, not, you know, arrogance, yes. but authentically bold mm. when you bring your truest self to the table. Um, there's lots of evidence of that <laughs> kind of authentic boldness in mm. your journey. How did your Mount Holyoke experience mm. help you find or deepen that authentic sense of boldness? No, what a great question. That is a really beautiful phrase, authentic boldness. It's, it's funny because the boldness part, I totally, I'm like, I know what that is. It, it, but I've been I, focusing on the authentic part of it. What does authentic, yeah. being authentically bold mean? Because there are lots of ways to be bold for all kinds of reasons, bold for egoic reasons or bold, sometimes, yeah. You know, insecurity can give rise to boldness to sort of compensate mm -hmm. um, but the idea of what it means to be authentically bold you know my, uh, so my the family that I come from I was raised by bold people and um, my parents for sure and the people I come from are like Polish Catholics and Jews these are like survivors and um, who were farm workers and factory workers and day laborers and, and very really uh, union organizers on both sides of my family. My dad's dad was a union local president. My mom's mom was a union local president. They were actually of warring unions, so it was like a real drama. <laughs> when my, my dad's Jewish and my mom's Catholic, so it was like, th they, it was a real big deal when they got married. But, um, but so I come from these people who are very bold, so I, I didn't know that how I was was bold, but apparently, that is one thing I, when I got to Mount Holyoke, I realized, I was like, oh, wait a second. I think I, think I must be bold here because I was sort of everywhere and very vocal and um, noticed how that was received. So I was like, okay, I got it. So I think um, Mount Holyoke played a role in, gosh, I mean, this is a place where I felt safer, I don't believe in necessarily safe space, but safer spaces. This is a safer place than I had ever been to really kind of um, unfurl my wings, so to speak, mm -hmm. and experiment with what boldness meant, to, try to be bold in different ways, and to, to accept responsibility for that, too, mm -hmm. the, the triumphs and the consequences of it. So just that I had a place that was all, where students were all women or trans, non-binary, uh, gender non-conforming folks, it was a really amazing experience that is just, you cannot replicate it. I mean, to have had the educational foundation that is just so powerful, where every person that was in a leadership role was either a woman or a trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming person. I mean, it was, there's something incredible about that. So the, so Mount Holyoke was a place that said, I mean, it was, it was slight mixed messages. It was like, yes, please, unfurl your wings and be bold here. And, and then I was like, all right, well, you know? And it was like, okay, you're suspended. You know, for, I was like, oh, all right, wait a minute. No, to Mount Holyoke's credit, after the protest, we were unsuspended. Uh, we, there was no suspension. But it, you know, it was, it, it, but I think that's also an age old tale of yes, young ones, please. You know, be yourselves, and then when you're yourself, like really testing the boundaries of that, and then it, it's like, well, wait a minute, and now we, it, we feel a little uncomfortable because you're challenging us a lot, and yes, that's what we're here for. That's why you picked me. That's why you picked you to be here. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the opportunity to have that tension, I think, was the big deal. I'm not sure if I was able to answer that, but I mean, there, I, it's very difficult to express the extent to which Mount Holyoke has influenced my life. Mount Holyoke is evident in every decision I've ever made. It's evident in every reality of my current life from my identity and having the courage and ability to do that from the work that I do. So the work that I do, the very first time I ever got a job doing this work is I was one of the first speaking, arguing, and writing coaches at the Weissman Center. So the Weissman Center is the very first place that I ever was an executive leadership and communication coach, and now I'm doing that in Silicon Valley for CEOs. Mount Holyoke's evident everywhere. In my friends, the people I count on the most in my life, they are Mount Holyoke alums. The people who have lifted me up when I really needed it were my family and Mount Holyoke alums. So in every which way, Mount Holyoke has impacted my life and helped me to feel confident in um, 
supported to be who I am, which happens to be bold. And I, but I would like to say there's lots of ways to be bold. You can be bold quiet. This is what I have learned. This is what's awesome about getting older. I love getting older. There's really, like something at 40, it was really like a little alarm went off and I just mellowed out. I was like, I woke up that morning and it was like, wow, something has really changed. I feel much more mellow. <laughs> I really do, which is a big deal. I mean, you might not tell that I'm that mellow by the way I'm talking, but this is mellow. Like, this is mellow. This is really mellow. <laughs> really mellow. And uh, so getting older is awesome because it, 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 it means that there's so many, I've learned that there's so many ways to be a leader that you sure you can have a title and that's, there's a lot of responsibility in that, but you could, I, I love being able to be a leader in quiet ways, in gentle ways, in graceful ways and if necessary, in whatever ways are going to accomplish justice. But it's nice to have a broader spectrum of how to accomplish that with, I have different, I have a much bigger volume, you know? There, there is now a low volume. There, you know? So, so anyways, I just wanna say there's a lot of different ways to be bold and to be a leader, and in every kind of role and in every way. And, as many people as there are on the planet, that's as many ways as there are to be authentically bold and to be a leader and to be an excellent communicator. And so that's really fun to realize and learn. So this is my, my way of being bold, which I didn't, um, I wish it didn't have to be bold to be authentic, by the way, because I wish we could just, I wish being authentic was just something we, that we just could be and were, that we, I wish we didn't have to work so hard to be able to be authentic. Mm. So the fact that it's bold, that's often bold is um, interesting to me. But. Yeah. Well, I okay. know we're going and to we open do. the floor yeah. now for some questions from Great. our audience. Great. So the floor is open. I think uh, Addison's given us a lot to think about. Hi, my name is Mai. Um, I don't have a question per se, but I just wanted to say that um, like I'm cisgendered, but I have like a lot of trans non-binary friends, and um, sometimes like especially like as they're graduating, I get this fear that like are we just like in a bubble where like their identities are being respected and like mm -hmm. it like what happens when they like leave this campus? And so to hear like an alum like for you to be here in trans and have so many successes and. Um, with your experience like being trans and being affirmed by like your workplace and just overall in your life has been um, really nice to hear. So thank you for sharing mm. that. My, thank you, thank you for, for sharing. I really appreciate it. And you are in a bubble. Enjoy it. I mean, I, that's how I felt. <laughs> I was in a bubble. Yes, it is a bubble. It is a bubble. And it's a really important bubble. To the, and it's not a perfect bubble. No, no institution, no person is, no institution is. And it's a really, it, my experience here was just one of the most profound blessings of my life. And at times it was painful, it was a painful blessing. But yes, there, there, it is different here, it really is. And ideally, the best parts of this place and the possibilities that were opened up are ones that I bring with me into the world. So I bring Mount Holyoke with me everywhere. The possibilities that Mount Holyoke sort of poured into me, hopefully I offer that, the sense, the spirit of possibility everywhere else. And I will also say, as a, um, because I was, I was always a, a, a very sort of masculine presenting um, person, it has, you know, I, I don't want to say the journey has been, uh, there, it, the journey has not always been, it's been very difficult at times. It really has. And even among other alums sometimes, being a trans guy um, as a Mount Holyoke alum has, brings its challenges. There are some really hard, painful conversations and interactions that I've had, uh, which isn't unique to Mount Holyoke alums. It's just being in the world. as a as a trans non-binary person. So it's been hard and at times. I will tell you um, when it's been hard, you know who helped me feel better and you know who laughed with me and supported me and loved me were Mount Holyoke alums. So I just wanna say that, that it, that it is challenging. Um, I guess I also wanna say that it's really important to stay connected. So after Mount Holyoke, 
I will say really Mount Holyoke alums are the mo some of the most important people in my life. And that's not, it didn't, I mean, honestly, sometimes I just feel really lucky because I would just bump into friends on the street just miraculously. It was really weird. Like I went through like one of the worst breakups of my life and I was sitting on, I was standing on the sidewalk after the place that I had rented with my partner. We, we broke up and moved out and I had just shown the new people who were gonna now live in this like dream place that had previously held this dream of this relationship. And so they, I showed them the place and they were gonna rent it and then they, they drove off and I was just standing on the sidewalk on the corner of Washington, uh, 15th and R in Washington DC, just like staring at this empty house that I currently inhabited for the next two weeks. And walking, I'm just standing there and walking at like nine o'clock at night, walking down the street was one of my dearest friends from Mount Holyoke, Carrie Scheid. And I just looked at her and said, are you Carrie Scheid? <laughs> And of course she was Carrie Shad. I knew she was Carrie Shad, but that was like all I got. I was like, is this really, are you really Carrie Shad? And she said, yeah, how are you doing? I was like, what are you doing here? She was, she lives in Austin. She was in town on business and just happened to be walking yeah. by my, and she's like, how are you? I was like, actually, I just went through this breakup. And I just like, you know, like, and I just showed the, uh, uh, and she was like, oh, wow, do you want to get some coffee? I was like, yeah, could we talk? You know, and this is like one of my dearest friends. And so it, it was just an amazing, so this stuff happens all the time, but, but there's also very intentional staying in touch. So I think that if I could just say that's a really important thing to do is stay in touch with the people you love here. Other questions? So, as we know, <laughs> I feel like I was raised by a mother that it almost seemed like she was never hopeless. Like, mm -hmm. no one was a big activist, and I felt like growing up she taught us to be the same way. Um, and, you know, me and my siblings to different degrees. I think I'm probably the most outspoken one, or the most, um, yeah, I would say the most outspoken one. Um, but I think my time here at Mount Holyoke, I've found myself specifically this semester feeling of like a lot of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. um, I might get emotional. Mm. Um, and just like how to work through that. Um, and uh, you know my mother, so. <laughs> I like, do. And sometimes it's hard, I think, having conversations about it when I think I'm talking to someone that to me seems like is never hopeless, and I'm sure that's not accurate. But um, just like coming from, you know, being the daughter of an activist. Um, just like working through, it, through that has been really hard for me because um, mm. I feel this big sense of responsibility. Mm. Um, and it's also, you know, like I think part of it is my own lived experiences that bring, when you were talking about um, like what had motivated you to like necessarily like make all these changes on campus or be part of this kind of change. Um, a lot of it had to do with like past stuff that has happened. So I think like from the beginning of time, you know, I had my first like encounter with racism when I was like four. Um, so I think like, and you know, has been throughout my whole life. So I think it's just like, I'm getting to a point this semester where it just feels really hopeless. Mm. hopeless. Um, and just like working through that. So like, I don't know, how do you propose <laughs> to talk about that or work through that? Um, yes. Sit Lali, thank you. Thank you for sharing everything you just shared. I love you and I love your mother. So see, Lali's mother uh, is Fabiola de Caratachea, and she, uh, see, Lali's mother is one of the biggest, really in terms of Mount Holyoke student influences. She, she's, there's, there are two points in my Mount Holyoke experience where Fabiola really absolutely changed my life. I really wouldn't be the person I am. I wouldn't have the views and opinions and thoughts that I have without your mother, without Fabiola. And one of them was when I just got to Mount Holyoke, and hopefully th this will answer your, you know, just not answer your question, because it's, it's a conversation. It's to, to join you in, in the experience and, and to be in conversation around a sh just a, an experience, right? Because this is something we have to be together and wrestle with, because none of us individually has any of these answers. It's just hard. So I think this is part of the answer is just, staying in conversation, you vocalizing it. You vocal, having the courage and the capacity to vocalize it and just us being together in the question, you know? But one of the moments with your mom was when I first got to Mount Holyoke, I had some limiting beliefs, beliefs that limited myself, my, my thoughts of myself, and my beliefs were limiting in terms of others too. I, I, there were, I had some mis, you know, I had some understandings 
that were wrong that I didn't yet know about, and there were and ignorance. There were just things I didn't know that I didn't know. But with but I had a ton of enthusiasm about what I didn't know, <laughs> and what I did not. I mean, it was just endless enthusiasm and certainty about whatever I did think, whether how, however wrong I later determined it was. Um, but when I first got to Mount Holyoke, I. I had very different views, frankly, than I do now. And yet I was very drawn to several leaders on campus. Your mom was one of them. Sarita Gupta was another. Sar Sarita went on to be uh, a, and is a major figure in the, the labor movement, a big leader in the labor movement, um, and others. And I was drawn, I had very different views, but I was very drawn. And there was a conference that was about to happen. It was the United States Student Association GROW training, grassroots organizing workshop. And I, for some reason, I really wanted to go. And so I expressed with authentic boldness <laughs> that I wanted to go to this conference where there were a limited number of people who could go. And there was a conversation among the organizers of this because I really had very different views. So here I was proposing to go to this conference and could have potentially really been a disruptive or sort of saboteur in some way because of my views. And so there was a conversation about whether or not I should be allowed to go, which was absolutely within their power and right to decide. They got to decide. And um, I think it was your mom who caught the short straw that had to give me the news of whether I could go or not because she, she was the one who gave me the message of, um, and she was amazing. She sat me down and she said, listen, we've talked about this, and look, we, we have some concerns because of some of the things you've said and some of the views you seem to have, but we believe that you're, there's, there's something else going on in your heart that, that gives us hope that actually with, with some more information you might have a different perspective. So you can go to the conference, but there's one condition that you not say anything when you go there, <laughs> that you just listen that you go there to listen and not speak. Now you can tell based on today, and I'm actually really trying to be brief, but it is not my strong suit. But back in Mount Holyoke, <laughs> that um, I was really, really vocal. So for, you know, this was not, I had really not shown any capacity to not talk. But there, but I loved, I just loved and respected your mom from the minute I met her because she's so powerful and just so strong and so graceful and so smart that this is why I was drawn to, to this group of folks. And so I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I went to this conference and I did not say a word. And I, I'm so glad that I, whatever capacity I had to just be humble and just say nothing, right? In part, it was because I, I realized as soon as I got there and I started listening and learning, I realized how many things I, I realized how much ignorance that I had brought to some conversations, how much superficial understanding I had, how little critical race theory I had been exposed to, and how, really how wrong I was in a lot of ways. And I, I am so deeply grateful for the opportunity to have found out how wrong I was because it was tough, it really was tough love, but it was love, it was really love. So your mom, uh, had that not happened, I really don't know what my views could have been, but I'm so grateful. So she, ha she has given me the same thing about the hopefulness. I mean, honestly, had she not had a little hope, despite some of the things that I had said, if she did not have some sense of what my heart was, I would not be sitting right here. You and I wouldn't even know each other. Um, but she did, and because she did, I became better. Because she, because she gave me a loving opportunity to change my views, I became better. So I want to just affirm your hopelessness. I can, I, it makes a lot of sense to me, and I can really relate to feeling hopeless. Uh, for for a, a decade solid, at one point, my 20s, I would say, were solidly hopeless. <laughs> I felt solidly depressed and hopeless for the entire decade of my 20s, for sure. And so I, I, I don't want to say that there needs to be a fix. I, I just, 
I don't want to say your feelings need to be fixed. There's really good reasons that you feel hopeless. There's, a, there's really terrible, sad rhetoric and violence of all kinds, and you've, the experiences you've had in your life, it, as you've described, you know, when you're four is your first memory of experiencing racism. I mean, that's, that's really upsetting and really sad. So I don't want to fix your feelings of hopelessness. I just want to offer empathy that it's really hard. What you're going through is really hard. And I can only say my own experience of hopelessness, the only thing that helps me to feel better is um, uh, my spiritual life is the center of my life. I don't, you know, we can call it love, whatever makes the flowers and plants grow, the cosmos, the universe, God, love, I'm comfortable with all those words. That, that helps me and how I experience it with other people that I really care about and respect. So connection, just really staying connected and doing what you're already doing, which is expressing your feelings and thoughts. Because I, I definitely don't have an answer for the hopelessness, just that. I love you and I admire you and respect you and your parents just want you to be happy. So I hope you don't feel too much pressure. <laughs> they just want you to be yourself and do what you want to do and be happy. So, it, and it's not all on you. You know, we, we didn't singularly break this. We can't singularly fix it. We can only do it. That's what Mount Holyoke taught me. We can only do it together with lots of different people who are willing to stick together and have each other's backs. and go through the hard times. So that's really all I got, Sitlali. <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to just say how wonderful it has been to have you here. I know our time is running short. Yeah. I promised you yes. something. Yes. So for those of you who are wondering, what did I promise? Addison and I had a pre-conversation in preparation for this, and then Addison said, can I ask you some questions? <laughs> and yes. I said, if we have time, maybe one or two. <laughs> yes, which I really appreciate. Yeah. In part because um, of the major uh, influences who are professors at my time at Mount Holyoke, I took two classes with you, Intergroup Dialogue and the Psychology of Racism. And in these classes, this is where I read for the first time unpacking the invisible knapsack, Peggy McIntosh. Dr. Peggy McIntosh, that really made such a huge impact. Mm -hmm. And intergroup dialogue, just the idea of deconstructing my own preconceived notions of other people. And so you, you're such a powerful influence in my life. And um, your presence as a leader, uh, I was always observing your way of being. I learned so much from your way of being because you described things so gracefully and I had, I had a lot of learning to do and the way you facilitated it was just such a consummate educator with just so much precision and so measured and also with care but also like real firm and direct <laughs> too, you know, yeah. all the above. So I, so I just have such deep respect and admiration for you that I really couldn't imagine a conversation where I, got, I answered questions because there's so much I want to ask you and so much I want to know about you. So I appreciate at least getting one question. All right. So the one question I think a lot about, um, especially in the context of institutional leadership, there's so many ways to be a leader, but in institutional leadership, it's a different kind of level of, it's a different skill set, a level of responsibility. But um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the strengths you bring to institutional leadership, and then what qualities you've had to develop to be the kind of leader that you want to be. That's a great question, <laughs> a great question. And I would say, for me, one of the things, you don't have to be a psychologist to be a leader, but being a psychologist helps a lot. Mm. Because um, having you know, been trained as a clinical psychologist, one of the things is that you learn a lot about what motivates people, mm. you know, why people do the things they do. Um, as someone once said to me, you know, it's much easier to deal with people when you understand them, mm. right? So, so that kind of understanding that comes through psychology is very helpful, has mm. always been helpful to me. But particularly being a clinical psychologist, mm. one of the things you learn as a clinical psychologist is how to listen to people. Mm. And I think, you know, it's one of the things that I have heard through your story is the power of learning to listen. Mm. Um, and I think the training I got as a clinician even before I became a professor, um, has just really helped me because I have learned a lot about listening. That said, 
um, what I had to mm. grow into, I think, is being center stage mm. because I am an introvert by nature and really enjoy my own company. <laughs> um, and, you know, in a role like this, you spend a lot of time with other people, mm. right? So you have to learn how to balance mm. your need for solitude mm. with the demands of, you know, being mm. center stage a lot of the time. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's so cool to hear. I just feel like sometimes we don't hear a lot about the inner lives of sort of higher profile leaders, you know? There's, there seems to be so much emphasis on um, I don't know, I, I, I'm guessing the higher profile of a leader you have, the more responsibility, kind of the, sometimes the less you can say, or, but I, it's just so helpful to hear your, about your humanity as a leader, yeah. and you like solitude. Yeah. May I ask a, one follow-up question about the sure. listening? Please? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, sure. So how, in terms of listening, how is listening so helpful in terms of being a leader? What does it enable or what does, what does, it, what does it allow you to do the more that you listen? I think if you're listening carefully to other people, one of the things you can understand is why they're doing what they're doing, whatever that thing might be, right? right? And so there's something, there's a concept in um, psychology called the fundamental attribution error Right, and for those of you who haven't taken Psych 101 lately, um, the fundamental attribution error is that problem that occurs when we make when we make the wrong attribution to what is motivating someone. Right, so if I'm just going to use a simple example, if somebody is speeding, right, and they get pulled over for speeding, we might say that person was you know driving recklessly, irresponsible. That mm. is a bad driver. Right, mm. but maybe they were speeding because you know their child is sick at school and they're trying to get there quickly. There's a family emergency of something. Mm. You know, there's something about the situation that is bringing out this particular behavior. It's not that they're an irresponsible person or reckless or any of those things. When we are doing something, we always explain our own behavior mm. in the context of our circumstance. Right? You know, I was late for the meeting because of this circumstance. Um, but when somebody else is late for the meeting, mm. they're rude, they're inconsiderate, they kept me waiting. Do you know that yes. um, we tend to attribute other people's behavior to something about their personality, but we tend to explain our own behavior in terms of our situation, mm. right? But if you're listening carefully to someone, you will start to understand their situation which makes you less vulnerable to making that common error. I love it. That was such a beautiful, succinct, calm explanation. <laughs> this is why I love being in your class. It's like, I don't understand this. And it's like, well, here is the architecture of it. It's like, so you're just like, thank you. That was great. May I ask one more? <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm sorry. OK. I'm going to have to go. Well, okay. I, I think we all have to go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, but tell me what it is, just because I'm curious. Okay, so the I question. I may not answer it. Okay, fair enough. The question <laughs> is, um, so you know, you love solitude, but you still do it. You still do the role because you, yeah. presumably there are reasons that you love it, or you like to do it, or that you appreciate about it. So what is it that you love about it? What drive? What, what drives you to 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 be an institutional leader in this particular way? What do you love about it? I like solving problems. You know, fundamentally, you mm. know, I, I mean, I like doing puzzles. I like, mm -hmm. you know, I like solving problems. And I like the fact that every day is different. Mm. I have a low threshold for boredom. And so <laughs> this is to say that, um, <laughs> you know, my, my team will recognize this expression, never a dull moment. Yeah. <laughs> there is I never a dull moment. So, mm. um, but fundamentally, I think, as mm. you said, you know, you wanted to be a therapist because you wanted to make a difference. Yeah. You know, anyone who wants to make a difference, if you see a problem, you want to solve it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that has always been a motivator for me. I love it. Isn't it so fun to learn more <laughs> about President Tatum? I love it. Wow. I love it. 
So, yes. with that, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you one sentence, a piece of advice you want to leave this audience with. Love yourself. Love yourself fiercely. You are lovable. You are worthy of love. You deserve love. Love yourself. Appreciate yourself. Love yourself in good times. Love yourself when you're learning and in challenges. Love yourself when you're making mistakes. Love yourself when you're doing your best. Love yourself when you're doing your worst. Just love yourself. You're worth it. And also, I'm a strategist because I believe when, when we love ourselves, it's, it makes it a lot easier to love and understand other people. And how we treat others is a reflection of what goes on in our own inner world. So love yourself because you deserve it. And also, it'll be easier to love other people. And it feels good. And it's fun. Please join me in thanking yes. you. Thanks.